before getting into this video, I think it's important to let you guys know that the information you're about to hear, especially within the closing chapter of this upload, has been gathered from Chris Kenyon's own book, which was released after his death. Now, obviously, this can't be used as definitive evidence or proof of what exactly happened in the last years of Kenyon's life, but the details within the book have pretty much been the general narrative and story reported everywhere. It's important for me to let you guys know that I, nor most people, will know the exact in and outs of Chris Kenyon's story. This video uses Kenyon's book as its main source. While we consume wrestling as a means of escape from everyday stresses of life, we tend to forget that the superstars who entertain us are dealing with issues of their own. A wrestler is still just a person, and as people, none of us are immune to turmoil in our lives. Whether it's work-related issues, relationship issues, or mental health issues. A wrestler who hid away most of his personal life, including his sexuality and his mental health problems, was Chris Kenyon. Chris was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, previously more commonly known as manic depression, during the last days of his WWE career. Along with dealing with this illness, Chris was also homosexual, something he kept hidden away from his peers and fans in fear of losing his job or being ridiculed. Chris Kenyon's story, unfortunately, would end in the worst possible way. To try and piece it all together, we must go back to the very start. Growing up, Kenyon was seriously into sports, playing basketball, baseball and roller hockey. He attended Archbishop Malloy High School in Queens and he graduated from the University of Buffalo with a degree in physical therapy. Kenyon worked for three years as a physical therapist before becoming a professional wrestler, so he was definitely smartened up on the importance of proper body care. It's been incorrectly reported that Kenyon made his wrestling debut in a tag match which also featured Shawn Michaels and Diesel in September of 94. Kenyon had actually made his debut over one year prior in Smoky Mountain Wrestling where he and Jason West were defeated by the Heavenly Bodies. Along with having the Shawn Michaels and Diesel match a little later, it's not commonly reported that Kenyon had actually gotten a shot at Diesel's IC title in his second WWE match on the 21st of June 1994 taping of Superstars. With this all said though, Kenyon was strictly used as an enhancement guy in the WWF. Before joining WCW in mid-1995, Kenyon was also used on ECW and the USWA before joining Ted Turner's organisation. Kenyon came into WCW as a jobber and eventually was put into a lousy tag team with Mark Starr known as Men at Work. Men at Work continued to wrestle together until mid-1996. Chris Kenyon would be repackaged in WCW as Mortis, but it took a little while for this character to debut. WCW before the NWO was definitely a weird place, a place where Eric Bischoff and Kevin Sullivan would try anything to get some sort of viewership. If something was a hot commodity outside of wrestling, you can bet wrestling promoters would try to cash in on the hot new thing and introduce it, somehow, into their wrestling shows. Mortal Kombat was a hot commodity back in the day, although by 1996, whenever the Blood Runs Cold storyline was announced, Mortal Kombat 3 was already released, so WCW may have been a little late to the party here. Anyway, yes, the Blood Runs Cold storyline would feature Glacier and Mortis, two characters heavily inspired by the Mortal Kombat games. It would take until 1997 for the storyline to actually start, as the NWO had arrived and the focus of the show was put on the New World Order. 
It was really odd too, as the Blood Runs Cold thing seemed like it was set in some sort of weird alternate WCW universe, where the Mortal Kombat style characters didn't really mash up with the other WCW superstars. I'm sure people liked it, but it really wasn't for me. Give credit where credit's due though, Glacier wasn't terrible in the ring and Mortis looked pretty cool. To learn more about Canyon as Mortis after his feud here with Glacier and his work with Raven's Flock, I recommend checking out my Raven WCW career video. Before moving on, it should be mentioned here that Chris Canyon was the guy WCW went to when celebrities needed trained to wrestle. Being a student of the wrestling craft and also his background in physical therapy allowed WCW to rely on Canyon to train the likes of Dennis Rodman, Karl Malone, Jay Leno and, yep, David Arquette. While it may have seemed like dirty work to some and surely not the way a top guy would like to spend his free time, Chris Canyon deserves recognition for taking the time to get these guys, who clearly didn't belong in a ring, at least somewhat prepared. After the Raven storyline, Canyon joined the Jersey Triad along with Bam Bam Bigelow and Diamond Dallas Page, where he won the WCW Tag Championships twice with the group while wrestling under the Freebird rule. After the Triad broke up, Canyon feuded with DDP. Soon after this, the WWF acquired WCW, and on July 6, 2001, Canyon made his WWF debut on SmackDown as part of the Alliance. The highlight of his WWE career was winning the tag titles with Old Jersey Triad stablemate Diamond Dallas Page. As the invasion angle was reaching its climax, Canyon tore a ligament in his knee during a dark match with Randy Orton. When the invasion storyline ended, Canyon went through more problems as he suffered a severe shoulder injury while working in Ohio Valley Wrestling. So severe was this injury that Canyon developed breathing problems and his lungs filled with fluids due to an allergic reaction to the medication he was prescribed. After his recovery, Canyon had dropped 32 pounds. After what must have been a trying recovery period, Canyon returned to working dark matches on Raw and SmackDown during late 2002 and early 2003. So here is where the information from Canyon's book takes over. Again, please keep in mind that this book was released after Chris's death. You must remember that this is information that was reported in the book. I don't want viewers to watch this and think it's the gospel truth, as we just don't know, and anyone who does say they know are simply reporting on what they have heard or read online. All we can do here is follow what Canyon wrote himself, along with co-author Ryan Clark. First we need to backtrack to when WWF acquired WCW. That same year, Canyon apparently decided to come out within wrestling and pitched an angle where he'd essentially be himself, a non-stereotypical openly gay wrestler. His friends liked the idea apparently, but it got no support from the WWE creative team. When Canyon returned from his injuries and began working Raw and SmackDown dark matches, he got used in a particular segment on SmackDown TV that also included The Undertaker. As a gift from the big show to Undertaker, Canyon would come out of a giant box that was set up in the ring, dressed as Boy George and singing Do You Really Want to Hurt Me to The Undertaker. This would lead to Undertaker beating up Canyon and giving him one of the most horrific unprotected chair shots you will ever see on WWE TV. Canyon's recollection of this segment was that the whole thing was seemingly designed to embarrass him after he pitched the gay gimmick to WWE. When the rumours started spreading online about his sexual preferences, Canyon asked if he could again just go full time with the original idea he pitched, just being an openly gay WWE wrestler, but again it was turned down by the company. 
Subsequently, Kenyon was relegated to the bottom of the WWE totem pole as he appeared in opening matches on Sea Show Velocity. On February 9th, 2004, after a year of facing two injuries and not being used in any major storylines, Kenyon was officially released from his contract. Now, you can come to your own conclusions in regards to the relationship between WWE and Chris Kenyon. We know the history, we know the stories, and it's easy to point fingers. This is for you to decide, not me. I do agree it's difficult to look at Kenyon's story here and not feel like he was the victim, but there has never been an official WWE defence on the matter, at least to my knowledge anyway. After he was released from the WWE, Kenyon came out of the closet and alleged that he was fired because he was gay. Kenyon later told reporters and radio personalities such as Howard Stern that this was all just a publicity stunt, but he later retracted these statements and acknowledged that he was in fact homosexual. Many people now look back and see Kenyon's behaviour here as a sign that things weren't completely right with him mentally. He was going back and forth here you can see in regards to his sexuality. Kenyon had also been showing signs of mental illness long before his bipolar diagnosis. As for years, he'd hoard everything from bottle caps and newspapers to printouts of email conversations with fans. His health was seriously worsening as each day went by. He did attempt to sue the WWE, challenging the independent contractor status of WWE wrestlers, but this wasn't a successful lawsuit. So you can see here that things weren't looking good for Kenyon, with the mental illnesses and the bipolar disorder and what seemed like some confusion over what he wanted people to know about his sexuality. It seemed like he was going through a real tough time. On April 2nd, 2010, Chris Kenyon's brother, Ken, found him dead in his Sunnyside, Queens, New York apartment with an empty bottle of antidepressants. He left behind a note of apology for his family. A few weeks prior to this, Kenyon apparently told friends that he wanted to end his life. So the story ends with the image of a man battling mental illness and living with a fear that being himself would damage or destroy his own career. Today, further steps have been taken in professional wrestling to include anyone and everyone on the talent roster, allowing people to be themselves when performing, with AEW being at the forefront of this movement. I'm not one to discuss social issues, especially within wrestling, and it's not what you click this video to learn about, but you do have to wonder if Kenyon could maybe have been in a better place had he survived in his life up until this very point, seeing the progression made in both pro wrestling and society as a whole. Mental problems are another thing altogether, and it did seem like Kenyon was on the extreme end of his issues. So after scripting this video and learning more about Kenyon, I feel I should say that if you're feeling down guys, or if you feel like life is getting too much, talk to someone, contact a doctor, or reach out to a support group.